Hi, and welcome to Module 2 of Lecture 7. In this module, we'll be discussing the core concepts of classical probability. Now, there are really only three definitions that are completely central to classical probability. The first is the, is the notion of an outcome. An outcome is just something that can happen. If I take a single die with numbers 1 through 6 on it, and I roll it, and I, one outcome is a 4. A different outcome is a 2. An outcome is the simplest sort of core notion of happening, right? Some possible thing that, that could occur. Um, that's an outcome. The second notion is an event. An event could be one or more outcomes. So for instance, if I roll two dice and I get a two and a five, the event in which I had a two and a five upon rolling two dice um, is composed of two outcomes, one in which I got a two on the first die and the second, which I got a five on the second die. So that event we call a compound event because it's composed of more than one outcome. A simple event is composed of only one outcome. The third notion is that of a sample space. A sample space is the set of all possible outcomes that could occur. Now at first that may seem like a really big idea, but for most examples that we're gonna deal with, the set of all things that could occur is actually pretty constrained. If I roll a single die, I can get one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six things that could occur. If I roll two dice, there are 36 things that could occur, keeping track of you know which die rolls which number. That's, that's all that can possibly happen in the world here. In applications, particularly in game theory, oftentimes you can only have two types of person. right? So the set of all things that could occur, you could be this type or that type. So usually the sample space is pretty constrained compared to what you might think by the notion of everything possible. Probability deals with issues in which the outcome is not known for certain. When the outcome is known for certain, we call the process deterministic. The outcome is completely determined by some process, some static process. Um, early physics was all very deterministic. If I took a billiard ball and another billiard ball and I hit the first and the second by knowing the angles and the velocity and the friction of the table and so on and so forth, um, I can determine exactly, supposedly, where the billiard ball is going to move. The billiard board's path is deterministic. It's completely determined by all the various pieces of the process, and I don't need to have any kind of randomness in theory attached to that. Um, in contrast, a probabilistic um, process involves not knowing the outcome for certainty. The class of processes like this are called stochastic processes. That's a big um, field you can study in statistics and probability. Well, mostly probability, sorry. Um, stochastic, probabilistic, and random all mean the same thing as far as we're concerned, even though random in sort of conventional uses tends to be associated with Kind of a negative connotation, right? Well, that's kind of random. That's oh, it's just done randomly, right? As in lacking thought. Um, here, formally in probability, random means the same thing as stochastic, means the same thing as probability. They mean you cannot determine an outcome with certainty. It is not a deterministic process. Um, so that's important to know. Um, so with that notion and the notions of outcome and events and sample space, that's really most of what you need to know for understanding classical probability. So how do you use that? Well, it turns out that the fundamental notion of classical probability boils down to a simple ratio. And that ratio, if we call probability of A, some event A, um, so here PR is the probability of getting event A, so PR is probability, PR of A is the probability of getting A, is really the number of ways to get A divided by the total number of outcomes. And by ways to get A, what I mean is the total number of outcomes that produce the event A. So let's just do that in practice. This is outcomes in the sample space. Now, let's take the example of one die first. 
So if you have one die, right, it has six possible outcomes in the sample space, one through six. Rolling a two, there is exactly one way to get an event that you get a two, and that is by rolling a two. So in that case, the numerator would be one, because there's one way to get a two. And the denominator would be six, because there's six possible outcomes. So the chance of getting a two, or any other number for that matter, is one sixth for a fair die. What if you have two dice though, and the event is a compound event? Let's start with the chance of getting a three. Well, how would you get a three? Well, you could roll a one in the first die and a two in the second die, that gives you a three. Or you could roll a two in the first die and a one in the second die, that gives you a three. That's it. So there are two possible ways to get the event that you get a three. So the numerator is a two. What's the denominator? Well, there are six possible ways, there are six possible things to get in the first die and six in the second die. So if you think about it, if you take one in the first die, you can get a one, two, three, four, five, or six in the second die. So six things already. If you had a two in the first die, you can get a one, two, three, four, five, six in the second die. So six more things. If you repeat that, you end up with 36 possible things. Um, and in fact, they just multiply them two together because they're independent. That we'll get to that in the next in the next couple of modules. But in here, if you have two dice, there are 36 possible things that could happen in the sample space. Therefore, the chance of getting a three, the event that you get a three, is two over 36 or one over 18. What about the chance that you get um, a seven? Well, how can you get a seven? If you get a two and a five, right, a two and a five, or a five and a two, you get a seven, that's two ways. If you get a three and a four, or a four and a three, you get a seven, that's two ways. If you get a one and a six, or a six and a one, you get a seven. That's two more ways, and that's it. So there are six total ways to get a seven. Therefore, the chance of getting a seven is six over 36, or one sixth. That's the most common thing to get is a seven, um, and this, you get a seven one sixth of the time when you roll two dice. This is classical probability. It's based on not, there's nothing subjective about this, is based on the total number of ways of attaining an event divided by the total number of possible outcomes you can, you can obtain in the sample space. That's classical probability. Um, other sort of versions of this are empirical probability, which relates to observed frequencies, right? So if I observe um, if there are a million people voting and 100,000 of them vote for party A, then the ratio that if I chose someone at random the empirical probability that I would choose a voter for party A is the number of party A voters divided by the number of all voters, or 0.1. That's the probability that I might choose at random from the population of a million voters, a voter for party A, given that I know the ratio, the empirical ratio of voters for party A to all voters. That's empirical probability is based on observation. Classical and empirical probability sort of merge to form frequentist statistics. Um, and that you have a class in that in pretty much every political science department, in the, or I think most social science departments in the country, um, there'll be classes on this kind of thing. Um, coming to favor more, more recently is Bayesian statistics, which relate to classical probability and subjective probability. Subjective probability is based on your perception of probabilities, and you, you have some prior perception of a probability, you take in new information, you form a posterior belief about the distribution of something or other. That's based on subjective probability, which is different from, um, which is related but not but different from classical probability. But so far, but what we're going to do in this particular lecture is deal with classical probability and the rules of classical probability. The good thing is all this stuff has very similar properties. It's all related very closely and conceptually. So don't worry too much about these distinctions. Um, they'll come up in sort of philosophical debates about methodology, but in terms of what we're going to learn here, it's pretty much all the same thing. We're going to try to understand how to manipulate probabilities in order to use them more effectively and understand um, top, substantive topics of interest to us. Thank you very much.